Hello, my name is Carter Souls, and I will be presenting today on um, Not the Apocalypse You Are Looking For, Contagion, the Crazies, COVID-19. And I want to just start by saying this is a very early stages kind of thing with this particular project. I'll say more about that in a moment. But this is a very kind of tentative presentation. So it is my hope that we will be able to have some good discussion uh, following the talk um, and that I'll be able to call a lot of very good ideas and suggestions from those of you who are tuning in. So I'll just start. Um, in March 2020, uh, Wired's uh, Lori Penny characterized the Trump pandemic response in the following way. Faced with a crisis they can't solve with violence, they dithered and whined and wasted time that can and will be counted in corpses. Uh, the pandemic film Contagion from 2011 is known for being uh, factually accurate in its depiction of a global SARS type outbreak and does feature some scenes of large numbers of corpses. Um, however, it assumes being made in 2011, an Obama era CDC. And in fact, the film's focus is on the CDC. Larry Fishburne plays Dr. Cheever, the head of the CDC, who is essentially the protagonist of the film. Um, Obama's investment in pandemic preparedness, including a pandemic playbook that the Trump team roundly ignored in 2020, uh, looks infinitely preferable to what actually unfolded in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The initial response under Trump was what, unfortunately, much more like the confusion and chaos depicted in George A. Romero's The Crazies from 1973. Uh, my talk title, Not the Apocalypse You Are Looking For, is the same as Penny's uh, Wired article. And in that article, her main argument uh, runs as follows. Most of our collective post-apocalyptic visions have in common the fantasy of the world becoming smaller. Our heroes, usually white straight men with traditional nuclear families to protect, are cut off from the rest of the world. The daydream is of finally shaking off the chains of civilization and becoming the valiant protector or tribal warrior they were made to be. Uh, but Penny says, instead, in the real COVID-19 pandemic, the world feels um, larger, not smaller. Right now, with over a third of the world in some kind of lockdown, with the entire world going through some version of this crisis, we are suddenly frantic to touch one another. And that disparity between those two things, the way Hollywood films or just the popular imagination think about pandemics versus um, our kind of lived experience of this one is the main subject of my talk. Now, again, this is a very tentative foray, and um, I want to acknowledge that this may seem a little strange that I'm talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, and yet both of my films were, were made well before that. In part, I am waiting for sort of COVID-19 cinema to happen. I realize there are some documentaries that have already been made, and I will be looking at those probably, but I'm kind of waiting for the first fiction films uh, dealing directly with the COVID-19 pandemic to come out. Uh, and indeed, these analysis today of these two films uh, is part of a larger project in which I will be kind of looking at the pandemic cinema subgenre or mode and looking even at some other earlier films as well like the andromeda strain from 1971 or 28 days later or some others so uh, just bear that in mind please it's just kind of a small cross-section of a larger thing um, but one thing i did want to kind of start with are a couple images that i think are very um, central to this sort of idea of pandemic cinema uh, which would be here the image of hazmat suits. I have seen a lot of films lately that have characters running around in various versions of these kind of white hazmat suits. It's kind of the one key staple of these films or it's one of the key visual staples of these films. And here's my favorite shot from Romero's The Crazies. Uh, so uh, where do we begin? Let's start with uh, Contagion. So um, one of the things that's at play in, in this 
discrepancy, you might say, between our imagination of a pandemic and our experience of it is in part that, as Michael Crichton says in the Andromeda strain, um, is that we, humanity, actually lives in a sea of bacteria, as he puts it. He says everything they owned, everything they touched, every breath they breathed was drenched in bacteria. Yet most humans don't think about that too uh, concretely. Um, so understanding the danger of a pandemic in real life, right, depends upon intelligence, abstract thinking, uh, science, right? Um, so the, the problem is our cinema often prepares us to uh, see pandemics as kind of these discrete sudden events, right? Um, but in fact, as we've now kind of experienced pandemics, many of them tend to kind of drag on. They're what um, uh, uh, scientists, where did he go? Um, Christian W. McMillan characterizes as persistent pandemics like malaria or HIV AIDS, or probably this current one that's gonna be with us for a while. So Hollywood films tend to represent these discrete events, but what we're experiencing is very different from that. So we have to kind of go in and cherry pick. And a lot of what you're gonna hear from me today has to do with the way these films depict the human response to the pandemic. So in Contagion, the focus, as I've said, is on Dr. Ellis Cheever, uh, and to a lesser extent, um, Matt Damon's family, the Emhoffs. Um, but certainly at the center of uh, uh, Contagion is a kind of family melodrama involving Dr. Cheever. So um, in the film, Kate Winslet plays uh, Dr. Aaron Mears, who is kind of a, a surrogate daughter to Fishburne and the, uh, to Cheever, excuse me. And so as the film kind of unfolds as a, a procedural uh, with these scientists trying to figure out a way to get a vaccine for MEV1, the name of the fictional uh, virus in that film. Uh, the real drama kind of happens as Cheever tries to coach uh, Dr. Mears through her experience in the field and ultimately uh, makes a decision to give up his own um, uh, dosage of the, the vaccine to an employee, the, the, played by John Hawks, the, the custodian at the CDC. His son needs the vaccine, and so Cheever gives up his dose to, to that kid. So this is very much centered on this kind of family melodrama model where uh, Fishburne is able to solve these, I should say Cheever is able to solve these problems via individual action, right? And, and sort of solving a real world problem like a pandemic in a, an emotionally and morally satisfying way. This is the melodramatic mode. So however, what's interesting is despite this so-called happy ending and Contagion does essentially end happily, they kind of beat back the MEV1 virus and they get a vaccine distributed. Um, however, near the end of the film, after that scene, oh, and here's scenes from the Emhoff storyline where Matt Damon gets a nice look from his daughter because he stages a little prom for her. But near the end of the film, uh, one of the very last shots of the film, uh, show this development company uh, mowing down trees in China that are a bat habitat. And so at the very end of the film, we viewers see, though none of the on-screen characters do see, um, the actual cause of the MEV1 uh, virus outbreak. And so the film manages to kind of end on a note of uh, horror, you know, the way most horror films would with the monster kind of threatening to return, right? We know, the viewer, what happened, but none of the on-screen characters do. So um, even though uh, the CDC was successful in, in knocking down the virus this one time, the implication is uh, that it will indeed be back, which in a way is very realistic. And it should be noted that Contagion is kind of known for its attention to realism. Again, it's in the service of the this melodramatic plot. So let's not overstate the realism part of it, but it, but it's in the mix, right? This idea that they brought in a, a consultant and were very serious about uh, the sort of um, uh, 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 CDC end uh, of, the, of the film, but again, based on a kind of an Obama era CDC. 
Meanwhile, George A. Romero's The Crazies takes on a very different tone, I would say in a far less reassuring tone, because essentially the whole film is a depicting a kind of descent into chaos. Um, the character you're seeing here, Dr. Watts, is kind of our uh, one of our main characters. The, the actual lead of the film or the two co-leads, are it's structured very much like Contagion is, where you have a military colonel who's running the uh, operation to lock down and uh, contain the virus, uh, Trixie, in this town, Evans City. Uh, and then you have a guy on the ground, sort of the parallel to the Matt Damon character from Contagion, uh, a fellow named David, who, like uh, um, uh, Matt Damon's character, is immune, naturally immune to the virus. But in Contagion, um, Mitch Imhoff is identified as being immune early on and it's kind of a known thing and all the people kind of comp competently work on developing the virus and you get scenes with uh, Elliot Gould plays a uh, an immunologist named Sussman he's probably the parallel to Watts here and Sussman discovers successfully the virus or excuse me the the vaccine so so it all works out uh, our buddy here, Watts, um, discovers right near the end of the film what he thinks is the successful vaccine. However, in the midst of all the chaos and miscommunication, and, and it need be said that um, the crazies is certainly, and in line with George A. Romero's other films of this period, you know, late 60s through the mid 70s, is extremely critical of the government and the military, right? The whole idea that the military could organize this operation is definitely brought into question. Uh, most of the scenes featuring Watts here or uh, Colonel Peckham, who you can see in the center of this shot, are very chaotic. There's always like people, as you can see in this shot, people kind of running into the frame, getting things signed, running back out, people coming in and asking what to do. And Peckham spending all this time on the phone yelling at his superiors and asking for things that he doesn't get. Um, and same with, with uh, Watts. Uh, Watts is kind of always asking for some special consideration so he can speed up developing the vaccine. And yet Peckham keeps telling him, no, we got to follow regulations. No, you've got to use this encoded channel and all this stuff. And, and so Watts just spends the whole movie like yelling into a phone and trying to develop a vaccine. And he finally does it. But then the film ends with, uh, if I can hit the right key, the vaccine actually being spilled and destroyed and lost. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, Watts himself is killed. A mo he, he's, he's working in a lab, a makeshift lab in a high school and a riot kind of breaks out in that high school and he gets caught up in it and he gets trampled to death and the vaccine is lost. And in fact, the film ends the final shots of the film are David, the one naturally immune person in the town, um, kind of crossing paths with Peckham as Peckham is deployed to yet another city that's suffering from the outbreak of the Trixie virus. So, um, uh, you know, there's not much hope um, there. And in fact, this is in line with what many commentators like Ron Becker have, have said of Romero's cinema in general of this period. It's, it's very bleak. Um, yet, in a way, uh, in terms of at least the, the mood and some of the specific incidents of miscommunication, misinformation, and ineffective response, this film uh, rings really true in, in terms of how the Trump administration uh, handled the virus. Uh, in its depiction of the fragmented, ineffectual human response, um, Romero's darker and chaotic film um, sort of metaphorically expresses what happened under Trump. Uh, incompetent guidance at the national level, leading to outbreaks of shocking public violence in addition to the virus run amok. One of the most interesting things about the crazies is that the virus, which by the way, of course, is a virus developed in a government lab, right? So, so in Soderbergh's film, in Contagion, the, the virus is set loose by human action, right? Um, uh, people going in and developing land and, and, and displacing bats from their habitats, and then they get into a meat processing plant, a pig processing plant, and so on and so forth. But um, 
in Romero's vision of this, it's actually not even a lab leak, uh, but in fact, a kind of a quasi deliberate leak of the virus. This is a virus being developed by the US military and it accidentally escapes due to a plane crash. So in that sense, the film is much more paranoid as well. But again, uh, reality, our reality, COVID-19 reality, uh, once again, maybe swinging around to agree more with Romero. Uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of reading about the lab leak hypothesis because there does seem to be some legitimate grounds for con you know, keeping open the possibility that COVID-19 did escape from a, a Chinese lab um, rather than hopping you know, between species that way. So simply to say, these films, uh, and I'm, and I'm kind of heading toward a wrap up here. Um, these films definitely have things to show us about, um, let's say the possibilities and the limits of our responses to these things. And, and I want to actually end with a quote uh, from, um, here he is, uh, Daniel Engber, a, a senior editor at The Atlantic, who was commenting on the lab leak hypothesis in a really smart article. And he kind of concludes near the end of that piece. He says, more specific evidence may never arrive, even after further study by the CIA or the WHO. A proper investigation might at any rate prove count counterproductive. What happens if it drags on into the future and never lands on anything concrete? What if no one can agree what constitutes substantive evidence? What if res researchers discover that SARS-CoV-2 uh, really did begin in bats or pangolins or frozen meat? These outcomes wouldn't make the risk of lab leaks in general go away, yet they'd surely shrink the scientific community's inclination to address it. That idea that pandemics are always already political, right? Uh, is kind of built right into um, uh, uh, pandemics themselves, right? Or pandemic management. Pandemics are inherently political because they, in order to respond to them effectively, this necessitates the intervention of state power into the individual's life, right? Lockdowns and masking and all the stuff that have been the hot button issues of the last year and a half or more. Uh, these issues are always at play. So there's always this kind of political dimension to it. Uh, and we've seen under COVID-19 that that can be pushed to rather far extremes. Um, so in that sense, again, the crazies may do us a greater service by really exploring where those extremes can lead. Um, but uh, I guess what I wanna end with is simply this political dimension of pandemics. They are not just a biological or an environmental or medical phenomenon, but a political one. And therefore our conception of them, our narratives of them, our, the way we think about them and the way we narrativize them to ourselves after the fact have a lot of very serious consequences. And that's why I want to explore pandemic cinema or the pandemic mode within disaster and horror cinema or, or you know, whatever, wherever we find these tropes. I'm very interested in exploring them and I'm very interested in hearing your uh, input about them, because I think going forward, these are going to be some of the important cultural resources we need in order to um, decide what to do next and decide what steps to take toward prevention and coping with whatever the next uh, pandemic outbreak is going to be.